anything, anything that God asks you to do, even if it's hard for you, He's only asking you to do it for your own benefit. Get over thinking that we're doing all these things for God. Jealousy. I want what you've got. Now there's some examples in the Bible of how different ones of the Israelites were jealous. And I'm not going to take the time to turn to both of them, but I will tell you about both of them. One of them was when Miriam and Aaron, who were Moses' sister and brother, came against Moses because they didn't like the woman he married. Said he had chosen a Cushite wife. And so bottom line is, I guess they didn't like the color of her skin. But that was not the problem at all. The real problem was they didn't like the fact that Moses was the boss and they weren't. And they said, well, I mean, do you think that you're the only one that God speaks through? Well, he speaks through us too. Well, God actually hit Miriam with leprosy. <laughs> And you know, just that, I mean, that can represent a whole lot of things in our life. But God said to him, how dare you speak against my servant Moses? You have to be very careful about speaking against people that it's clear that God has anointed them and is using them. Come on now. And actually, we're all the anointed of God, and we need to be very careful about speaking against one another. But when God has chosen someone to minister for him, it doesn't make them any better than you, but there needs to be a respect. And in our society today, much of that respect has been lost and is very tragic. And of course, a lot of it's because ministers have behaved foolishly and made a public spectacle out of themselves by doing things wrong. You don't want to worship a spiritual leader, but you need to respect them. And God said to them, why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Why were you not afraid to do that? Well, long story short, she got leprosy. Moses prayed for her, which shows his character. Because he could have said, you deserve everything you get after the way you talked about me. But no, he prayed for her and said, oh God, please, please, you know, don't do that. Another situation was, um, okay, forgot his name. Well, another guy, Korah. <laughs> he got a band of people together. You know, it's really bad when you've got a bad attitude yourself toward a leader, but then if you go around... And that's the most dangerous thing that we have in the church of Jesus Christ today. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think they should have done that. Well, did you see that new car that preacher's driving? Well, look at those earrings that, that his wife's got on today. Well, I just don't. Did you hear where they ate yesterday? And I can tell you the absolute honest to God's truth. I believe that the root of all of that is jealousy because somebody else has got authority and we want it. See, really, there is a proper way to bring correction to somebody if they're doing something wrong. And the Bible is very clear about it. You go first privately to your brother. And then if he won't listen, you take it to two or three others. And then if he won't listen, you take it to the church. But it never says that you just... So Korah wanted Moses' position. Long story short, the ground opened up and swallowed Korah and all of his group. And that was the end of them. So I suggest that we 
Stop wanting what other people have. You know, I used to watch somebody that could sing and had a beautiful voice. And I think, oh, I wish I could sing like that. I wish I could sing like that. One day the Holy Spirit stopped me. He said, stop saying that. I put that gift in them for you to enjoy. And if you sit out there and wish you had it, then you're not enjoying it. Do you know the gift that God put in me is for your enjoyment, not mine. All it causes me is work. I mean, you know, the same way with somebody who brings you great worship. I mean, that gift is put in them for your edification, for your exhortation, for your upbuilding. And that doesn't mean we don't enjoy what we're doing, but, you know, you can partake of our gift and not get tired. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the other thing that I despise about jealousy is People who want what you have don't want to do what you did to get it. And so this is an area that can be very painful to face. But until we get over being jealous of other people and envious and wanting what they have and not liking it when they get something that we didn't get, The full blessing of God is there for us, but we will not be able to enter in and partake of it because we've got a wrong spirit. Dave is not inclined to get up and give too many prophetic words in a meeting, but I do remember one time he came up and he said, I've got a word for the congregation. And uh, he said, God wants you to know that until you can get happy, really happy, for what other people have, you're never going to get what you want. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> See, part of all that comes back to insecurity. We don't really know who we are. We don't really believe that God's got an individual plan for us. We don't really believe that God's going to do something special for us. And so if we're not getting what somebody else is getting, now all of a sudden we wonder what's wrong with us and why doesn't God love us? And So it all comes back to the me thing. Actually, the Bible teaches us in Exodus 20 that not coveting what other people have is the tenth of the Ten Commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now let me put it in better context. <laughs> you shall not covet your neighbor's swimming pool. <laughs> you shall not covet your neighbor's brand new car. You shall not covet your neighbor's house who is bigger than your house. You shall not covet your neighbor's housekeeper <laughs> or their gardener or anything that your neighbor has. You should say, God, I'm so glad that you've blessed them with help and given them a nice swimming pool and I'm just happy for them. And I think it's okay to say, and if you should choose, I just want you to know I'm in that line. <laughs> but I'm happy for them. And if you even start out lying, I mean, you can tell God, really, we both know I'm not happy for them, but I want to be happy for them. <laughs> There's no point in playing games with God because He already knows. I want to be happy for them. God, please help me be happy for them. And God actually will. He will help you if you will get honest about where you are. Then God can help you get to where you want to be. 
I believe that contentment honors God more than any other thing. I actually was thinking about this sometime last week or the week before, and it just came to me one morning as I was spending my time with God that nothing honors God more than for us to be content. Because really that contentment is saying, God, I trust you. I believe that you're doing the very best for me right now that you can. I know that my times are in your hands and that whatever you're doing in me, if you're not giving me what I want right now, even though I don't understand it, I know that you've got a good reason and I trust you. And so I'm just going to be happy where I'm at while you're doing whatever you need to do until I have my breakthrough. I know how to be abased and live humbly in straightened circumstances. And I know also how to enjoy plenty and live in abundance. I have learned. He didn't just know it right off the bat. He learned it just like we're learning it. I have learned in any and all circumstances a secret of facing every situation whether well-fed or going hungry, having a sufficiency and enough to spare, or going without and being in want. Next verse. I have strength for all things. I have the strength to be stable if I've got everything I want. I have the strength to be stable if I don't have anything I want. I've learned how to be content, whether I'm abased, are abounded. Whether I'm the one in charge or the one taking orders. Whether I'm the one serving or the one being served. I've learned how to be content with who I am and my place in life and my part in life. And I'm content with what God has given me. Now, let me tell you something. To be content doesn't mean that you're satisfied to the point where you never want anything else. Let's put up verse 11 again, Philippians 4, 11. Not that I'm implying that I was in any personal want, for I've learned how to be content. And look at what the Amplified says. Satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or disquieted. So it doesn't say that you're satisfied to the point where you never want anything else to happen in your life. But you're content where you are right now while you're getting to the next place that God is going to take you. I think one of the greatest tragedies among Christians is not enjoying the journey. We're always going to get happy when? When? Well, when I get married, I'll be happy. Eh, not necessarily. <laughs> the longer you've been single, the longer it may take you to get happy being married. Because you've just got to have your own way about everything for a long time. Not just a little time, but a long time. And it's beautiful. Marriage is beautiful. But if you have to have that to be happy, then there's something you have above God. Or, or whatever it is, you know. If you have to be in ministry. If you have to have a certain job at work. If you, you know, whatever. It's always something. If you've got to have a bigger house. If you've got to have anything. Learn how to enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going. Ask God for anything you want. But don't ever be jealous of somebody else who gets it before you do because it may just very well be that God is putting a little test in front of you to see if your attitude is right and if you're at a place of spiritual maturity where he can indeed give you the thing that you're asking for. I've never had anybody who had a nice car be jealous of me because I have one. <laughs> you know, when, the more you're in the public eye, the more you're likely to have a lot of ugly things said about you. And, uh, you know, you go through a cycle with that. I mean, I used to get hurt and mad and angry and, you know, all these different things. And now I'm just like, I feel sorry for them. I mean, I really do. 
because they just don't have any idea what they're talking about. I mean, the bottom line is, is an unbeliever just doesn't get a believer. They just don't get it. We, you know, we just don't make any sense to them, and so there's really no point in trying to explain or defend yourself because they're just, they just don't get it. And, uh, but many times in interviews, when people will say, well, you know, how do you, how do you handle all the criticism or, or why do you think people are so critical? I just say, because they're jealous. They're jealous. People who have what you have don't get jealous of what you have. <laughs> Amen? And the thing that I think is so funny about it is most of the people that are jealous of you are not in any way, shape, or form prepared to do what you did to get to the place you're at in your life. There's nobody who just rolls out of bed one morning and has all their dreams fulfilled. There's a process, there's work, there's responsibility, there's patience, there's sticking things out, never giving up, on and on and on. Amen? Just remember that God is not in our life to give us everything we want. Matter of fact, his number one goal is not to make us happy all the time. He wants us to be happy, but that's our choice. He doesn't have to work day and night giving us first one thing and then another so we can smile one more day. Amen? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, Godliness accompanied with contentment is of great and abundant gain. I really want you to get this. Contentment doesn't come from what you own. It comes from your relationship with God. Contentment comes from knowing who you are in Christ. Contentment comes from no longer needing to impress people. Did you hear me? You're not free as long as you have to impress somebody else. When you can say, I don't care what you think, and not in a sarcastic way. I mean, to a certain degree, we all care what people think. But there's, there's a truth also in being able to say, you know, I get it. I understand where you're coming from. I've been there, and I know you have different attitudes and opinions about me, and I just really don't care because I know that you really don't understand. Amen? I went through all that, being jealous of the boss, talking about the preacher, on and on and on. And I had to come face to face with these truths that I'm sharing you. The only reason why I acted like that was because I wanted what they had and God wasn't giving it to me. So please, every time that you even start to feel disgruntled and discontented, stop and take a quick inventory of what you have. Amen? Amen? Don't make me work hard. It's Saturday morning and I'm... <laughs> Don't you think it's hard to keep yourself satisfied sometimes? You know, human flesh, I mean, you, you can get something and be so thrilled about it, you think you can hardly stand to stay in your skin. You've believed, you've prayed, and now God has given you that nice house that you've wanted. Oh, it's so beautiful. You love it. You had fun decorating it. Blah, 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 blah. And two weeks later, you're discontent now because you got this big house you have to clean all the time. <laughs> anyway, point well taken. I love Psalm 1715. I'd like you to look at this with me. The first time that I saw this psalm, I just thought, that's it. As for me, I will continue beholding your face. And I saw this scripture at a time in my life when God was really teaching me how to seek Him first and not what He could do for me. Did you hear what I said? You seek God for who He is, not what He can do for you. You seek His face and not His hand. If you seek His face, you'll find that His hand is open a lot more. As for me, I will continue beholding your face in righteousness, rightness, justice, and right standing with you. I shall be fully satisfied when I awake to find myself beholding your farm and having sweet communion with you. When we can wake up in the morning, our first thoughts not be about 
the five things we have to have to keep us saved that day? Or what is somebody going to do for me today? Or, or you know, how all these things that, you know, oh, I've got another day. <laughs> but when we can have the sweet, wonderful fellowship with God, have our trust in Him, to where when we wake up in the morning, the first thing we're thinking is, God, I love you so much. Thank you for what you've done for me. Lord, I appreciate knowing you and the progress that I've made in my life. And just to know that you're even, that you're going to be working in my life today, that's such good news. And so maybe you've got a few hard things to face that day. You say, God, I know I've got some hard things to face, issues going on that are not very much fun, but I'm so grateful that I don't have to go through them by myself. I'm so grateful that you're here to help me in each and everything that I do. And I hope you help me quick, God, but if you don't, I'll trust you with that too. I'm going to stay content. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first, not second or third, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. You cannot fail with that scripture. Stop seeking things and just seek God. Tell Him, God, if you never do one more thing for me, I'm happy in you. Because just to know that I'm going to spend eternity with you is more than enough. Just to know that you love me unconditionally, that somebody loves me unconditionally, that there's somebody that accepts me totally the way I am. Somebody who knows everything about me and still loves me anyway. Now that's a friend. Amen? And we have to have these conversations with ourselves. I'm, I'm having a conversation with you this morning. But we need to have these conversations with ourselves too. You have to remind yourself every time you start to feel disgruntled and discontented. You need to take yourself in a corner somewhere and have a talk with yourself. Lose the attitude, Joyce. You are blessed, 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 blessed. True contentment honors God, I believe, more than anything else. You know, I think one of the dangerous things that we often do is we do part of what God told us to do. <laughs> but we don't do all of what God told us to do. Or we put it off until our timing, and really then there's no anointing on it anymore because we didn't move in God's timing. Ecclesiastes 11 says, do not wait for all conditions to be favorable or you'll never sow. Well, God, I'll give that extra money as soon as I get my next raise. No, if you don't give that extra money when God tells you to, you may not ever get that raise. And even if you do, the devil will take it away from you. Anything that God asks us to give or to give up or to do for somebody else, there's many things that are seeds that we sow. Anything, anything that God asks you to do, even if it's hard for you, He's only asking you to do it for your own benefit. Get over thinking that we're doing all these things for God. It's for our benefit. When we do part of what God asks us to do, but we don't do all of what God asks us to do, we're giving a sacrifice and not obedience. I'm going to do it my way or not at all. I'm going to tell you something that I think you should do just to help you. And I'm going to do this myself. Maybe a hundred times a day we should all say, God, your will be done and not mine. Let's just do that for practice. You know, like, your will be done and not mine. <laughs> hundred times a day, just while you're cooking breakfast, going to the store, you're changing the oil in your car, you're mowing the grass, you're driving to work, God, your will be done and not mine. I want your will, God, your will be done and not mine. And another thing I'd like you to confess more is, God, I surrender to you. I surrender to you. 
We need to be pliable and moldable in the hands of God like a soft piece of clay. Anything that God is asking you to do or asking you not to do, He's asking you for your own benefit. You know, it might not feel good right now, but if you'll do things God's way, Whatever discomfort you go through is definitely going to be worth it in the end. రోజు నేను వా దగ్గర నీళ్ళు తాడానికి వెళ్తూ ఉండే అందరిలా అబ్బడికి వెళ్ళి చదువుకోవాలనుకుంటే కానీ పోతుండే అందుకే అందరిలా నాకు ఫ్రెండ్స్ లేరు ఎప్పుడు చూసినా మా పిల్లలు బాగా ఉండరండి ఎప్పుడు చూసిన ఈరోచనాలు జ్వరం అవుతుండే డాక్టర్ కాడికి వెళ్దామంటే పైసలు లేవు ఇంకా పిల్లలు అట్నే పండుకొని ఉంటారు వీ హవ్ బీన్ ఏబుల్ టు ఐడెంటిఫై దీస్ విలేజెస్ త్రూ గవర్నమెంట్ అండ్ త్రూ సమ్ లోకల్ ప్యాస్టర్స్ సో దిస్ వెల్స్ వాట్ వీ ఆర్ డ్రిల్లింగ్ త్రూ జాయిస్ మైర్ మినిస్ట్రీస్ నో వీ టేక్ ప్రాపర్ కేర్ టు ఫైండ్ వేర్ ఈస్ ద గుడ్ వాటర్ through a good water diviner it will take about 3 uh, days to go to that village and drill the bore well to give fresh water to the villagers na pillal kuda badik botaru నేను కూడా పొలం పనికి పోయి బాగా సంపాదిస్తాను ఈ గ్రామంలో బోరే వేయించడం ద్వారా ఇక్కడ ఉన్న వాళ్ళందరి జీవితంలో ఎంతో మార్పు వచ్చింది ఇక్కడ ఉన్న వాళ్ళందరి అవసరాలు తీరుతున్నాయి కాబట్టి యేసు ప్రభు దేవుని తెలుసుకొని సంఘంలో సభ్యులుగా చేరడానికి ఎంతో ఆరాట పడుతున్నారు మాకు ఇక్కడ ఒక బోరే పిచ్చి మా ఆత్మీయ దాహాన్ని తీరుస్తున్నారు మేము పాస్టర్ ద్వారా ఆ నిజమైన దేవుని తెలుసుకొని ఈ సంఘంలో ఆ యేసు ప్రభుని ఆరాధిస్తున్నాం worden we door vele stemmen, gedachten en meningen overspoeld. Hoe kunnen we erachter komen wat God ons door bepaalde levensvragen en dagelijkse uitdagingen zeggen wil? Joyce Meyer legt in dit boek uit op welke verschillende manieren God met je kan communiceren. Bestel nu hoe je Gods stem kunt horen telefonisch op 026 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-meyer.nl Alle boeken van Joyce Meyer staan overzichtelijk op een rijtje in een brochure. Geef nieuwe impulsen aan je dagelijks leven en bestel deze gratis brochure nu telefonisch op nummer 026 20 22 100.